We got the pleasure and privilege to have Dr. Denise Stockley here from Queen's University and the president for the Society for Teaching, Learning, and Higher Education. Denise is visiting our great province, uh, not for the weather, as we know, but for, because uh, she has some family roots here. Uh, that's right, right, Denise? So she's here for uh, over a week in the province and, uh, you know, has been so generous to offer some time to come uh, to Memorial and chat with us about uh, teaching, learning, higher education. So she got a... Um, uh, presentation for us this afternoon. I'll just give you a little bit of a brief though. She is at Queen's currently and her position interestingly enough is titled Professor and, and Scholar in Higher Education with the Office of the Provost and Teaching Learning Portfolio, meaning she's the equivalent like of an AVPA role here at Memorial in Teaching and Learning. So it's just an interesting twist on her uh, choice of, of, um, of title. And her current research focuses on how we create and study environments that promote learning, such as the impact of national teaching awards, research ethics and training, and competency-based medical education. So welcome, Denise, and we're delighted. Thank you very much for, for doing this this afternoon. I have to laugh because, you know, with this teacher evaluations, you know, student evaluations, I, I re realized I used to get feedback that said, Denise, you know, or Dr. Stockley talks fast. And I got rid of it once I read that. And I just said, well, I'm from Newfoundland originally. <laughs> but I can't use that here. So, <laughs> but, but that stopped, actually. As soon as I said, I'm from the East Coast, from Newfoundland. If you think I talk fast, think about my grandmother, because it's really, really slow, then, <laughs> then stop that one. But uh, I, what I wanted to, to share with you, or what I, when we were talking about the kinds of things I could share with you, we talked about some of the work that I'm doing at Queen's, but also nationally and internationally, is looking at impact. And we look at impact from a lot of different ways. And so there's not one right way or wrong way. It's, this is just the way that we've adopted. I'm going to share my PowerPoints afterwards. So if there's any gem that you see or, or nugget, you'll get them all. Um, my, my, apparently, they're, we're, we're being video recorded. So if I tell some story that's not there, and you think, oh my goodness, I need that one again, you'll get that again. Just, Slow it down. I said, slow down the pace. So what I want to ask, though, is have you already engaged in, encouraged, or enabled integrated scholarship at your institution or doing scholarship beyond just what's happening within your own research area, unless you're studying learning? Have you done research, like teaching and learning scholarship or different kinds of research? Have you done that already? A few of you. Put your hands up higher. These are going to be your best friends if you decide to do this, OK? Because one of the things I want to suggest to you is that having friends and buddies and different people, either locally or provincially or nationally, really important to get work done. So we're going to talk about some of these things. I'm going to spend some more time on things and less time on others. And as I said, you'll have the PowerPoint. So if I spent less time on what you really got excited about, then we can go from there. If you have questions. I'm going too fast. Just put your hand up, and then we'll stop and just answer it then, rather than waiting till the very end. Sound good? All right. And thank you for coming over lunch. This is always exciting when I see a lunch crowd who's not eating. All right. So just for one minute or two, why do we assess impact? Why does it matter? Think about it. If you can pair up, that'd be great. Make a new friend. You can pair up in the back there, you know. Why do we do this? And it's okay to say, I have no idea. I just showed up because somebody dragged me from the, down the hall. That's fine, too. <laughs> but just talk, basically, why are you here? <laughs> Did you learn something new just to show our hands? Did you sit beside your best friend who you knew everything about already <laughs> is another question. Don't want the answer there. The idea of assessing impact is really, really important in today's day and age because we talk a lot about accountability and we also talk a lot about strategic leadership and strategic this and strategic that. And often we create programs or do research or do things and we actually don't think about why are we doing it? meaning that we're doing it because there's a funding proposal or there's uh, somebody told us or we thought it was exciting, but we actually don't look at why. 
or what is the long-term impacts. So I'm very privileged at Queen's. I have this amazing role where I actually am tasked, my one-liner is to build capacity for scholarship and research in higher education. Not just teaching and learning, but higher education. And it's absolutely fun. It's fun. Why? Because everything becomes a research project in my world. So I liken it to how many of you, and you don't have to do a show of hands because I know you have your colleagues in the room, have sat on a committee for years, or maybe it feels like years, <laughs> and then it implements something, or there's a direct result, and then it happens, and then people forget why it happened, and then we start over again doing something else. Because we didn't take the time to actually write down or figure out whether or not it actually did what we said we would do, and if we're doing creating a new education program, like as in, in your discipline, you say we should have a program in X because the government will give us money to create this program. We create it. How do you argue that it was useful? And so this is where my, my position at Queen's is all about measuring impact. So I've worked with our medical school on measuring and creating competency-based medical education. I was part of our executive team that led that initiative. And we launched successfully in 2017 our entire specialties. We actually have data that says we were successful. Not because the dean said so, which is actually brilliant when he does, and our provost and principal do, but because we actually have hard data that says that we did a successful launch. And so that's what I do. I come in not to collect the data necessarily. I come in to help and support people to think about it. When we think about learning outcomes as an example, do you have learning outcomes across your, we have them in Ontario where you all have them. When you ask your dean, are you, again, some of you may be at the decanal level, what is the key or main learning outcome of your faculty? Do they have the story? Do they know what that is? If you ask your dean, what are some of the high impact activities? Or what are the kinds of things that your students are talking about or your faculty? They can tell you right off the bat. They may not be ones you agree with or support, but they can actually tell you what are the stories. So when I, my position was created at Queen's, we went around and met all the deans to say, what's happening in your schools and your faculties that are exciting? And who knows? And the who knows is you're going to go as faculty and, and others to conferences and you're going to show off and you're going to say, I did this and it's great. But you didn't write about it. And I don't mean write just journals, but you didn't make it public. But I'm, I won't say which university we use at Queen's, but we have a university we use to say, oh, so-and-so did it. But we actually created it in-house, but somebody else wrote about it and they now own the idea. And so what part of my role is to say, what are we doing? What can we do better? So one more example, and then we'll move in. Truth and Reconciliation, we had a committee at Queen's. I wasn't on the committee, but they did a whole town hall series. And the co-chairs of the committee came to me and said, is there a way that we can do this differently? Because what's going to happen is when our committee gets the data back, they're going to infer what they hear or what they heard based on where they, their positionality. So we took all the town halls and did a qualitative analysis and did a thematic analysis of the town halls that were then put into the Queen's report. So even though it was a service-based committee, we actually put a research lens on it in order to say, here's what the community said. And so when you serve on committees, I always say to people, because some of them are high confidential, not, you're not going to publish or talk about them, but when they're not, how can we learn from them? Because what happens is we keep repeating the wheel. In fact, I was saying earlier in a, in a meeting this morning, you just have to be somewhere long enough and then you sound brilliant, right? Because it's somebody else's idea that just comes back up again and nobody ever documented it. So I want to focus on why we do this, why impact is so important, and I apologize if I block people's view. It helps an institution, from an institutional level, rethink what we value. Because we say a lot of things we value, but how do we know we actually demonstrate it we value them? Accountability is a big thing. We have more metrics and more metrics that we have to respond to across our institution than anything else, I think. Having future-oriented faculty development, what do people need? Where are we going? And of course, when, if you see any of the research that I published recently, you'll always see a student there. You always see staff, and you'll see faculty. I don't, I, because everybody's involved in the process, I include everybody on it. And it's not gratuitously included. It's these are people who actually did the work. And so if you were to say to me, Denise, here's a paper on ethics you published, I can identify for you who is staff, who is faculty, and who is student. Because again, we believe in giving the credit out. 
again, different disciplines, different issues, different problems. But recognizing who's involved and who's engaged becomes important. And th that's part of it, the assessing the impact. I've uh, encouraged a lot of process type papers in more recent times, not just product. In the, uh, um, as I, I actually find this to be a really um, funny scenario. In the days when you, we used to do print journals, like your articles were printed in a print journal, you're limited to how many words, but you're expected to tell when, you're, when you deviated, when there was a change. You're, you actually talked about your process. And now with online journals, we have sometimes less words where we actually skip to the, the punchline without saying how we got there. And so I really encourage people to think about conceptual papers and process papers because if we're going to replicate, which is a big thing in many disciplines, our journals aren't necessarily giving us that space and place to replicate anymore. And so this comes to me as about impact. And I always ask people, are you trying to make a difference or make a point? And making a difference is how do we include things that helps change perspectives? And making a point is getting that one perfect piece out there. And so the idea is that we don't have space in publications to do that. So they're not all publications. But think about if I'm going to change someone's perspective, how can I do that? And so when we talk about teaching and learning, often um, you're doing something that's brand new for you. And maybe you're the first. But it could have been done for 20 years in a different discipline. So again, recognizing what's been done before and how do I build that in? Because it's still exciting that you've done it in your discipline, but you're going to publish that in your disciplinary journal or go to a conference versus going to the national conference in that area who say, you know, we've been doing this for 50 years. Welcome to the party. So the idea is thinking about what do you have to share and why? And some of you are not the people who are going to be sharing. You're the enablers. Often somebody does something really, really cool, and they don't even know they've done something cool. Why? Because it's just what they do. And so you may have a colleague down the hall who you hear things about. You may be encouraging them to start looking at impact. So I talk a lot about this idea of integrating scholarship. I do a lot of service in my world, a lot of service. And you know, I love doing research. I also love teach. I like everything in that, that thing. So uh, uh, the idea of integrated scholarship is, again, how I was talking about how do you build it in and how do you bring it in. And if you're on a big team, like a committee, not everybody's going to be keen or want to do anything extended. So you s figure out who wants to be part of that and who just wants to be acknowledged, and you move forward in that way. And not, again, not every committee you ever want to publish on, because some of them are just really dry and not as exciting. But some of them are things that are worth sharing. All right. So I'm going to just briefly go through some ideas about how do you collect uh, research for teaching and learning, and why do these things matter. So I've been involved in helping some individual faculty work, as well as, as department-wide and faculty-wide. You know, when people say at, in Ontario, we have a group called the eCampus Ontario. Queen's has been the most successful in getting grants for online learning. If you know Queen's history, you say, how did that ever happen? Well, we've actually documented how it happened. It wasn't just one night somebody dreamt this up. So you can actually see how we went from having very few courses online to being one of the leaders in Ontario. Documentation. So there's a lot of opportunities. Um, but there are a lot of risks, depending on your department, that you may be in a situation where this is a ri very risky thing to look at impact. Because sometimes the worst case scenario is you actually find that what you did was not impactful at all. And then you have a crisis saying, do we continue this or do we not? When I did my doctorate in, um, I, I, was, I, I love my master's research. It was on elaborative interrogation, a cognitive learning strategy. It was so exciting. And I did it in a, in a specific classroom with special needs. And it, but we pulled the kids out of the classroom into a lab. Beautiful results. Absolutely gorgeous results. And then I did, went to do my doctorate at Simon Fraser in Ed Psych with Phil Winnie. And the first course I had to take, they said, analyze your master's results based on a different construct than the one you used. So I thought, hmm, what will I do? So I chose transfer. Elaborative interrogation, for those who don't know, is this beautiful thing where you give, for example, science facts, um, where, as an example, where students often have misconceptions. 
and you ask them to say, why is it true? So they elaborate on the fact. And so they actually remember the fact, even though they haven't in a long time, like they haven't been able to get it because they actually did the elaborations to, to make their own elaborations. It doesn't matter if the elaborations are correct, they'll remember the fact is true. Brilliant cognitive strategy. So I chose transfer. You know, you want something to transfer in one situation to another. Well, that sounds reasonable. We talk about transfer a lot now. But when I reanalyzed my data, guess what happened? It had no transferability out of that situation. And I was brokenhearted. I was sad. Thankfully, it was at a time when you had a lot of years to do your doctorate. So I spent the first six months moping that what I thought I wanted to do when I grew up was not what I wanted to do anymore. And I actually have shifted my entire paradigm of what I do now is about transferability and moving things outwards. It's hard when you actually do impact studies and you actually show that your work does not have impact. And there's different scenarios where you will say, and this is the risk, it doesn't have impact because they actually won't see the impact till later on. That's when you want to do longitudinal studies. Or it may be, you know, I love this so much that I'm not willing to let it go, which is actually a different scenario. And so this is what collecting the data can do for you. If the government or somebody is giving you money to do it and you say, well, we can't afford not to do it, then you actually start infusing other things into it to actually build that impact. Because at the end of the day, the money will run out. But if you can demonstrate that you did something impactful, then you'll always continue to have other sources of funding. Opportunities, again, you know, my position I have now is built on the fact when I was, I was in our center for teaching and learning uh, for 13 years, these are things I did off the side of my desk. Oh, you want to do an NSERC create grant? Sure, I'll read it over. Sure, why not? What do I know about ultra large scale software systems? More than I did when I did start writing the grant with them. So you learn along the way. So here's some potential areas. Are there other areas that you're already doing impact studies on that are not there? We can, anybody just want to shout it out and I'll repeat for the microphone. Anybody doing things outside of those areas? And are you measuring impact at all? Faculty development. Faculty development, absolutely. Instructional design. Community engagement. Community engagement, that is a big one right now as well, absolutely. Arts and creativity. Arts and creativity, yeah. Anything else? None of those are simple things, you know. Oh, we had one of them more, yes? Uh, indigenous way of assessing learning. Indigenous ways of assessing learning, absolutely. And, and even how we think about research changes when we look at different perspectives, absolutely. So the idea is that there is no limit. And so a lot of the work that I do sets up other people or other projects along the way. So when somebody says something about this, it's like, I, it's not my work. I actually refer them to three projects down the road from somebody else. But we have to start thinking about those things because, again, they feed into the larger whole. This is one of my, you don't have to, this isn't meant, um, there's a link there, but what I want to highlight is we often mix up research, quality improvement, and program evaluation. And often when we're responding to government requests, and I use the word government requests, not being talking about your Newfoundland government, who I'm sure is absolutely incredible and amazing. <laughs> but we often mix up those terms, and we mix them up. So when we're, do, for example, when you do research ethics, not all of them require research ethics, right? And so our TCPS2 says where you need research ethics if you're doing a research. So I was mentioning this earlier this morning, um, for those who've done core, if you've done core, the ethics program, if I'm sure you all said yes, but there was a consent form there, and at the bottom is my name. I'm the program evaluator for the secretary responsible for research ethics. And you say, but that's a program evaluation. Well, it is for the secretariat, but it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me because, not that I don't love ethics education, which I do. I love ethics education now. I came in to see they created all these new programs did they actually do what they said they would do? So I didn't come in with a program evaluation question. I came in with a research question. From the secretariat's point of view, they wouldn't have required ethics. In fact, we argued back and forth, do we require ethics or not? But from my end, I did. So research ethics is, all starts with the question you ask. It even is who you talk about. So when you're doing program evaluation, 
you talk about stakeholders. When you talk about quality improvement, you talk about clients. And you talk about research, you talk about participants. So the language changes depending on what you do. And this website here, again, you will have this as a copy, does a great overview of each of the three differences. And you say, well, why do I need to know? Because fundamentally, you need to know when you're doing impact, who are you doing it for, and who are you going to give the response to? So the idea is that if you're doing a program evaluation, typically it's going back to the organization that you're doing it for. And if you're doing it as part of a thesis or dissertation, it's going to be adjudicated or evaluated through a PhD or master's committee. So you have two audiences. But if you're doing it as a consultant, you may be coming in as a different thing. Impact, measuring impact does all three. We use quality improvement, program evaluation, and research. All depends on why you're doing it. So, yes? I have a question about the, the external funding. Mm -hmm. So you say that funding for giant issues or for program evaluation is typically budgeted, but then it goes to the service operating budget. It takes time, though. Mm -hmm. And so I already receive a salary that's already in the budget, but I'm doing five other things as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you, within your institutional role, then make make uh, make time for that uh, mm -hmm. for the researchers involved? Uh, mm -hmm. How do we how do we carve out space for that? That's a good question, and we'll come back to it. But was, the question is, how do we carve out time? And time, as for all of us, irrespective of your discipline, your family life, is a precious commodity. There's only 24 hours in the day, and you know biologically we do have to eat, sleep, and other things. So that limits our time even more so. I love when people tell me they're busy or too busy. And that's my, you don't want to get me on the wrong day. <laughs> because I look at what my life is and, and I have a lot of different initiatives both internally. I'm also the vice president of our international consortium for educational development. So I have a lot of roles. Yet I always make time. What do I make time for? What matters? And so what it is is I have to make a decision as to what's not going to matter at that time. And so what I do is I surround myself by really solid teams. And so the, I, that's basically how I do what, keep all the balls in the air is I have solid teams. Not the same team. I don't have a team that follows me from project to project because they'll all burn out if they're on every project. So I, I have different teams for different purposes. But I always say it's not about being busy, it's about setting my priorities properly for what I need to do. And any day that could shift. And so the institution's values and priorities match that in terms of how they allocate Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes and then when they don't, I come with this list and say, here's what are my priorities or what I have on my list. Which one's not on yours? And when they see it written down, often they say, oh, everything. Well, if you want me to add this, then something has to give. And so I don't actually make the choice in my institution what gives. I ask them what's going to fall off. And if they want me to do something else, then they have to provide resources differently. So that, it's a great question, but so if you ever say to someone you're busy, think about where your priorities are. And there are times when I, you know, if I'm doing something where it is time, place, based, I am busy. My calendar says I can't be somewhere, like right now, there are people harassing me by email and I just ignore them because they are not my priority right now. You're my priority. They will become my priority later on when I'm trying to avoid something else. <laughs> but that's the idea. Is how, so that's what we do. And so the other thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit more um, when we get to talking about grants. We're not very good naturally, and some of you will be exceptional, and you need to help your friends out of learning how long something takes. So we will say to somebody, oh, it's only going to take five hours, or I'll take two weeks, or take six months, a year, or longitudinal study, three years. Well, I just finished a three-year longitudinal study, and we planned two years to get all the data out. So it's actually a five-year study, but three years of data collection because we know it's going to take us two years to get all this data analyzed that we'd collected. So we're not as good at that. So I always do a margin of 1.5 because I know myself well enough to know that even I mess up because I'm relying on other people for stuff. So I always factor that in. So being really solid at time estimates is really important. And that only comes with practice. If you, the grad students who work with me will tell you that I'll tell them it's going to take you five hours knowing that this is the first time they've done it. The next time they do it, I expect it to take them three. Because I, I build in learning time, and we forget often when we're dealing with newer colleagues or even experienced colleagues in a new area, there's a learning curve. We are experts for a reason. 
We are experts because we learned how to master that content or that area and we give it back. People coming in the field are not experts. So I build in time to build community, to build, if I'm having people rely on each other, I build that in. And then I build it into my grant. I always build in, I don't call it, you'll never see a grant that I write that says community building time. No, you'll never, Tri-Council doesn't fund those. But they do fund the idea of project management, dissemination, other things which allow you to build in those things. But that's a really um, um, important question to ask. So here's a few tips and guidelines just so you have some concrete things. So the idea for this is how do you start? What do you do? Let me just pull it up so I'm not looking up or looking back. Um, so if, if you don't have a project in mind, and by the sounds of it, some of you don't at this point, what is the one thing that you do right now, or your colleagues and you do right now, that you think is going to be an interesting question to look at? Or what is the problem? I always tell people at, at my work that there's two ways to get me moving. One, I get really excited. Usually I even use that word in my grants. I'm really excited by something. Or on the other end, I'm really ticked off. So in your own research teaching worlds, what are you most excited by? What, what do you just, when somebody mentions it, you smile about, or whatever you do, like you just, that's your happy place? Or what is it that you know you just can't get right in the classroom, or you can't get right in your research, or in a community? That's what you study first. Because the things that go like this, you know, I, I liken it, again, um, you know, to you know, rocks that skip, right? When you skip rocks, eventually they have an impact, but you may not actually see the impact. And that's okay because change happened. But if you just throw a rock and it goes straight down, of course people could argue theoretically that the waves will keep going, but in theory, it ends right here. So the idea is, what is those things for you that you think you might want to study? And it doesn't have to be big. Some of my projects are going from A to B, and I'm done and never look at it again. Some of them I wish I was done, but will be with me for the rest of my academic career. So you can have both, and thinking about which ones make you get up in the morning. That's an important thing. Context is really important. I was a reviewer on a journal, as I started to mention earlier. It drove me, it drove me batty when people would present something like they'd never seen it before. And of course, the last three editions of the journal had it in there. I always encourage people, especially when you're publishing outside of your home, and many of you, if you're doing scholarship of teaching and learning or teaching education research, are outside your discipline, look at the journal, see what they publish, and then refer to the journal, because you want to have a goodness of fit there. So how do you plan to address the issue? Always important. And you may not know. You may actually be going in doing a fem phenomenological study where you're just going to see what's happening, and that's okay too. But if you do know, you, are, you, know, you created a new program, and the end result is they should be graduating with this, you actually have your starting point. How, what do you need to collect? to get there. Really important, you can only collect baseline data once. Baseline data is before anything begins. Because once it's begun, you, are, you, you can never go back. It's all a reflection at that point. Well, I remember when we started, it was, I felt like this. And of course, that's all in hindsight they remember that. They don't. So the idea, if you want baseline data, whether it's like admission grades, or whether or not it's interviews or questionnaires, or whatever you have. We have a data warehouse type thing. Whatever your data is, how are you going to collect it? What do you need now? Because you can't go back and ask somebody their experience. You can ask them to reflect on it, but not about how do they feel at this exact moment. And then I have people will say, well, I'm already five years in. Is it too late? And of course, you can guess my answer. It's never too late, because you can actually collect point in time data. So if you've had a program or a course or something you've been doing forever, now's a perfect time to start. You're just gonna ask different questions later than you would have at the beginning. Because if you've been doing it forever, it's always helpful to know, well, why was it successful? Was it because of the in, in person who's in front of the room? Is it because of what's happening? Is it the dynamic? I could teach the same course five times in a row and everything goes well and the last course is everything flops. Everything's the same. And so peeling away the layers of why did it fail? Or, and it not, didn't fail from one perspective, it failed from mine. Because everybody didn't have whatever I was trying to build, my, my goals. 
And I, I peel away the layers to find out why. And I ask the students after the course because of ethics and everything else. How will you share? I, I just want to, we talked about evaluation already, but how will you share is important. The top peer reviewed journal is only one approach. We are so fortunate in today's day and age, we can make public in so many different ways. When we're about to do something that's going to have a real high end impact, we get it out very quickly. So it's been the public domain. And then we work on the, the, the masterpiece writing. Why? Because between here and here could take three years. And somebody will have told our story before we got here. And so thinking about how are you going to get out? We use infographics. When we launched our competency-based medical education, we used infographics for our incoming students, for our faculty, for everybody, just to get, again, a public interface with that for our patients and our, our caregivers. So the idea is that you have to think of who your audience is and why they need to get it out. Timeline, this is what we're talking about, time. Time is so critical. We often, especially if you're applying for an external grant, they say we'll only fund you for 18 months. And my colleagues will say, but it's gonna take me two years or three years. And, I, and I, my <coughs> argument back is they're only funding you for 18 months. Are you gonna put in a three-year proposal? Or are you gonna take a slice of it that can be done in 18 months? And usually it, it, it's very painful, especially if you love that three-year project, to part down to the 18 months. Because there's no funding agency that wouldn't give you money if you're willing to work and have your students and whoever else works with you for free. They may say it's unrealistic, and that will be one of the checks against you. And so you have to be very careful that you actually do a project that's amenable and doable in the timelines that they give you. If it's your side of your desk, your passion project, work on it as much or as long as you want. And you pick away at it. And so it doesn't matter. Timelines are irrelevant in that case. But knowing how much time you have. Again, resource implications are, are really important as well. Why are resource implications important? Because when we budget things, we think about if you're for example, you have graduate students or undergraduate students working with you, you think about them in hard dollars and cents. How much am I going to pay you? But then we have to think back one step and say, somebody has to do the paperwork to pay them. And then you go back and back. So it's not actually what, and that's the overhead part of it. You have to think about who's involved, what's the cost, and are there resource implications? So for example, I've been in, I won't name the faculty, but where they said, well, we're not going to, to do any of that financial end of it for you. You have to do your own. And that adds on another layer of knowledge that you have to have. We have a system where I have to learn a whole new uh, you know, a system online in order to do the payroll and things like that. Am I willing to invest the time as a faculty member? Things you have to think about is what are the resource implications? Also, a, a little tip for grants, if you have any standardized software, for example, um, do you get any software for free like NVivo or uh, SPSS? Does your licensing agreement with your university have things? Do you have any software for tools for analysis that you can just use off the shelf? You do? On your grants, put those in, in kind. So we've worked out, for example, we use SPSS and NVivo at Queen's. We've actually worked out how much it would cost us if we were going to be going to apply for a grant. So that becomes part of our in-kind contribution. Often we don't think about it because we turn on our computer and it just shows up magically for free. But there is an actual cost of it and we build it into our grant so the funding agencies know we have in-kind beyond this or that, that we actually give software and things like that for free. When you don't ask for a computer, you're contributing that to the project. Again, not all grants have in-kind, so you have to be aware that you don't add an in-kind section if they don't care what you do. But when they do, think about what you're doing. Ethical implications. We all follow the TCPS2 at, in Canada. We do not all interpret it the same way at local research ethics boards. So uh, you need to find out who your local office is, as in what do they say. For example, um, at Queen's, we created a form for teaching and learning research. And um, you say, well, I'm just going to study myself. It's a self-study. Well, that's still a TCPS2 research ethics problem. As in you have to have ethics, we created forms to address that at Queen's in order to simplify. Because just because you're studying yourself doesn't mean you don't require ethics. And so you need to know what your, your lay of your land is. When in doubt, the, go, go find out who your chair is. Do you know, did people know who your chair of research ethics for is here? Greb? Make them your best friend. 
I'm sure they like coffee or tea or something. And defining authorship is, is a quirky thing. And you say, oh, I don't want to do that right now. We'll see how things transpire. That can become your biggest nightmare at the end if you don't talk about authorship at the beginning and expectations. It may be that people are more fluid, but I found out that for some departments, if they're anything more than the fourth author, it doesn't count, for example. Or in one discipline, being the last author means you're the most important. and In another discipline, it means you're the least important. You have to know what the norms of the discipline you're going to be working within and why it matters. In my discipline, the higher up you are, the better off you are. And I work a lot with disciplines where the end is better. So my discipline looks at it and thinks, oh, it's great. Whereas in reality, it's the opposite. So you need to know what authorship expectations are if you're doing interdisciplinary work. And if you have this thing where everybody wants to be in one order, then you have to think of ways to negotiate that. And uh, I always like to have that conversation as early as possible. But we always have the same conversation before we send it for publication, because things happen from the first conversation to the last. And we have that conversation again, and we talk about, well, what does it mean? So those are, again, some tips. Sorry, Mike. There you go. So going public. Any questions about some of those things? I, if we had more time, I'd go into more about doing qualitative research and how do you do interviews and focus groups and different approaches and quantitative and talking about how do we do questionnaires and different kinds of things. But those are sort of tools or means to an end. How do you collect the data? The most important thing is, what do you want to study and why? And that, that to me is, becomes what the essence is. And then you know, seeing who you need to surround yourself with. All right. All right, so I'm just going to, I just have a few slides that I thought might be of use or of interest, but going public and what does that mean? So support mechanisms. Look at that list and count how many of those that you have. It won't be a Facebook quiz where you get your data stored somewhere else forever and ever. But just think, do you have all seven? How many do you have? I find I, I used to do a lot of single, like all by myself in my office type research. And what I found is as I, I was getting along in my field, collaborators are brilliant for a lot of reasons. One, because you know that idea of shared thinking, but two, it keeps me honest. Why? Because somebody in that group at different points will always care more about the timelines. So I'll get an email saying, where are you in this? In fact, I had one last night saying, you know, you haven't reviewed that paper yet. You know, the final edits, it's like, oh, OK, tomorrow maybe. So I find collaborators can serve both cognate areas, as in disciplinary or knowledge-based purposes, but also in consolidating the group. And so the idea of thinking about who is your team, you want to have a diversity of people on your team. You want to have people who bring different skills and different attributes, but not just cognate knowledge, because that's just one area. The idea of you know, looking at who are your people here, beyond here. I actually have a writing day at my house most Fridays. I don't know who's showing up, but it's an open invitation. I have a, about four or five different spaces people can work in the summer. We, we have summer, so it's actually better. We have different spaces outdoors. And I invite people to come over for writing days, you know, at least once or twice a month. And what they do is we're all working sometimes on completely different work. But what it does is we're all sitting in a space. They all find comfy spaces. And they work. We also do this at the university. We don't, you know, you don't have to invite everybody to your house or wherever you live. You know, it's not doesn't mean that. But the idea is getting people to come together to write, because we create it writing as a solo activity. Because if sometimes, you know, you're saying, I don't know what word, I don't know what word needs to go here because it's not making sense. And some will say, read the sentence, and then they all perk up, and you read your sentence, and then you have half a dozen voices who tell you what the right word is, rather than sitting there, you know, saying can't move on because I'm fixating on the one word. So we, we do that kind of thing where we just write together. And you know what? I've been more productive. Why? Because A, they're coming to my house, so I have to have something to write. But B, it's actually a concentrated time because going back to your time question, I have enough things in my day to fill up my day that I never would find time to collect data, do research, or collect data and sit on it because it just sits there because I don't have time. 
And so I find that time. And whatever your style of writing is, and you may say, I don't have a style of writing, that may be part of finding a solution. Well, what will make me better? Some people say, if they have young children, my best time to write is before they get up or before they go to bed or whatever your scenario is. You find out what your best writing time is and use it. And if you don't have one, that's okay. Life is ebbs and flows. You may have a furlough and then you go up. And if you're pre-tenure, the panic is, but I can't have a furlough right now because I'm, I'm working towards something. And then find your people who will help you keep going. Very important. Do you have other strategies, anybody here, that aren't on my list that I should think about adopting? I think this is related to your communities of practice, but we, NL Carr, Newfoundland Labor Center for Applied Health Research, has mm -hmm. research exchange groups, mm -hmm. and we collaborate, mm -hmm. we invite community policy people and academics and students. And nice. So the idea of bringing in groups of people, do they come together to write or so to just to, no, to just discuss? and to, to learn, to discuss, to yeah. plan, to collaborate. And, yeah. and they're around specific topics like okay. aging, okay. you know, mental mm -hmm. health. Yeah. yeah, and often that's where you find out who's interested in what and how you can bring it forward. So that's great. Our teaching and learning center is also a great resource. It fits into a few of those categories yeah. in terms of designing that. Absolutely. And often we are looking at a problem within our own discipline, not realizing that another discipline is also looking at it or looking at it differently. Um, I think that's great. So again, here I just pulled out some health science education, research education journals, you know, citations. Again, depending on your discipline, citations matter or don't. So when you do an interdisciplinary group, always find out, again, what they value because your values may be very different. And so you may have this great relationship with a person, and then you realize that things are falling down because you actually didn't talk about what are the values. So going public with citations, education journals. I wanted to put this up there because this is how science is, but we have a list of journals. If you're in physics, we have a list of journals that are amenable to publishing education-based research on physics teaching, chemistry, math. You know, All the disciplines have them. I pulled it this one just because this, this Medicine is, oh, and health sciences are overboard. They have so many, it's so exciting. But uh, they may not be ones that you're familiar with, but they exist. And then if you, you may say, well, they're not indexed or they're not this or that. Again, are you making a point or making a difference? And that's where the barometer sometimes happens. One of the models we use, I mentioned our, um, so this is the authorship from the School of Medicine. I use this all across campus. Because some people feel they deserve authorship because they came in the room, right at the moment when you said authorship. <laughs> right, so they, the, the school, the medical education journals got together and they came up with these four criteria. And, and they sort of make sense. Did you contribute conceptually? Did you contribute to the final work? Did you approve the final version? I have colleagues who have published articles that they never read at all before they went out because somebody put their name on it. And this stops that from happening. You say, well, depending on your stage of career, you might be really excited by the paper to have your name on it, but you may not on the other side. And so I use that as my criteria, irrespective of the discipline. And, if, and in fact, I, we may work on a paper together, and I'll say, if you don't sign off on it, which is what my colleague did to me last night, you're not on it. And I, you know, I wrote the darn paper, but they'll kick me off if I don't agree. And that's important because then it comes down to, if you're at a conference and I say, I read your paper, this, that, and you say, well, I had nothing to do with it. This says that you did. And so that's the idea. For our competency-based medical education model, again, this is just one. I've been part of the arts and science blended learning, all kinds of different projects. We created a service paper model. We spent three years meeting weekly for our executive team, and there are papers that just have to come out about our, our project about you know, our process, because we get asked everywhere we go, how did you do X or Y? None of us on the executive, there's eight of us, own any of these. Collectively, we own them. So we came up with a service paper model about the eight different foci we had, and then each person becomes a color, and they become first author and eighth author on each of those papers, because they have to come out. So I may actually write a paper that I'm the fifth author on, but it's part of this idea that it's just, Somebody has to write it. And so if there are things in your world which is amenable to a service paper model, 
had the conversation. We talked about this our second meeting. We didn't wait till three years in to say, oh, we should get a, the word out. I knew the paper I had to be in charge of when I had to get my act together. We had the last service, two papers coming out in the next year. And so that's the idea is that we, those are for those committees that you are on, that you may be excited by, but by the time they're done, you're saying, Phew, move on. These are some of the, uh, the journals out of STLHE, our Society for Teaching and Learning Higher Education. Our CJ Sotl, we publish every discipline. We don't have, you don't have to be an education researcher or education developer to be in there. So people from across the disciplines have presented in there, which is also very exciting. And if you go to our conference, we don't do proceedings. We do something called CELT, our collected essays. So after our conference, you can submit a paper. So those of you who are in Winnipeg, you'll be getting an uh, invitation to say, would you like a paper based on your work that you presented here? And it's a peer reviewed journal as well. And again, many disciplines do this by nature and, and by trade, so. And we're bilingual. If you, you know, if you want to do French or English, if you want to do it in another language, we can talk. And again, there are lots of these journals. There are lots of journals. There are none, you know, closed house. Some conferences. Here's a few that you may be thinking of. We are going to be in Ottawa next year um, for STLIT. We just had ours in, in Winnipeg. ISOTL's coming up in Atlanta, Georgia. ISOTL is the International Society for Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. If you are doing research on teaching and learning, like as in your teaching and learning in your classroom, you have the best of all worlds. Why? Because you can present in your local discipline. You can go to a, a, a national or international group on SOTL or scholarship teaching and learning. So you actually open up a wide world of things. When I work with individual faculty member, I say to them, who's your intended audience of your work? Is it your people, as in your group, or is there a wider audience? Because that helps define what journal or what conference you go to. And of course, at MUN, you just had yours in May. So if you missed it, next year, next year, you need to be there. And again, you can start at different places. And it may be somebody from your group presenting. And, and you sort of, again, build that capacity. And you know, you want to get people excited and motivated. And so that's one way to do it. And again, you know, disciplines, there's so many different ones. I just want to end talking a little bit about funding. Um, because one of the things that I've found over the years is people fixate on tri-council funding or government funding. And there may be other ones that you get excited by, but there are so many different ones. This is all Ontario.ca. I put that here because you see there's a magical word here that says national. A lot of private companies give money away that have nothing to do with their actual thing that they do. And there's a great list there, and they're not for Ontario. So, for example, 3M Canada, which, as we all know, makes 3M post-it notes and a lot of medical different things. and. They sponsor our 3M National Teaching Fellowship, our, 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 one of our big programs and our student fellowship within the society. Does that have to do with them selling post-it notes? No, but they have a philanthropic arm on community. And so they fund our program through that. So there's a lot of those and looking wider. Also, some people focus on the big dollars. Often the most exciting things I do actually have very little money attached because those are my passion projects, the ones I got excited by. And so, and particularly for, for people moving into a new area, I know Tri-Council has, you've moved into a new area of funds. Not easy to get necessarily. But starting off with a smaller pot of money sometimes actually can make the difference to springboarding to larger. But again, be aware, you're not gonna go for the large pot of money, for, you know, as in your, sorry, let me backtrack. If you have a two-year project and they're giving you $5,000, you have to say, what can I do from that two-year project for $5,000? Or if you're a person who's in a, a discipline who's, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars versus millions of dollars, what are you going to do differently? So those are some things to think about. I do a lot of work with um, our VP research office at Queen's with uh, Christina Arsenault. And so these are some tips. And again, you may have these already. So I just wanted to end with a few ideas because I hope you get really excited by some idea. And then you may say, in order to be able to do it, I might need a little funding. I love when I talk to some of my colleagues, they start the grant writing the night before it's due. Like, you know, studying for an exam the night before it's due. 
plan again accordingly. Build your team. I usually have two criteria. If you, if you look at my larger teams, two criteria. Are they competent? As in, do they have the skills needed for this project? And number two is, are they fun? Because if the large project, if we're going to be together for five years, you know, you want to spend some time with somebody. And again, everybody will have a different definition of what their criteria is, but know what yours are. You know, what are you, what are you looking for in your team? Competency is always should be number one. Often people, my colleagues, faculty, including me, are, don't like to share their grants with other people because, you know, don't want someone else to read it. You want your feedback from your colleagues, not from the reviewers. Often the things that actually turn you away, particularly for the Tri-Council, they have so many grants, they're just looking for an error. And if somebody else can catch it, let them. I uh, did a lot of reviewing for our research services for many years because that's how I learned to be a grant writer. I, I actually read people, not just who were funded, I read papers as they went along. We talked about this, be realistic and ambitious. Can you read this at the back? Um, oh, good old Isaac Newton. Often, as I was, I've been saying over and over again, we, we dream really big. I, I always dream big. My, my, my head is always out here. But you have to be realistic on how you can get things done. And, and chunking it into bite-sized pieces is one way to go. Unless you get the multi-million dollar grant, then don't chunk. Just do it all. Just do it all. And um, we, uh, we also seem to forget about uh, grant writing. Our passion is here. But your reviewers are all over here. When the NSERC Create program was first created, uh, just anybody familiar with the NSERC Create program? A couple people. It, it, what's brilliant about that program, biased, they actually have an educational developer sitting on it who has no knowledge about NSERC at all. So if you don't write that grant for somebody who's a complete lay person, then you're not in the pile. And why is that brilliant? It's, it's brilliant because it forces you to think about who your audience is. And so that's an important thing. Knowing your audience is so critical. Even if you are before a review team of people exactly in your area, they will have taken a different lens than you have potentially. You know, the reviewer number three scenario. So make sure that you're clear and concise about what you're doing. And um, what we've started to do is write really good paragraphs describing things, and then we reuse them. So we spend a, a meaning that if we, we describe our team in a certain way, our team is our team. And so we, we actually start spending more time writing those critical parts that actually define us better. And if there's a way to define, depending on the project, define our project, we use that over and over again. We don't start trying to rewrite our project uh, of what we're trying to do. It's not plagiarism, it's our work and what we're trying to do. And the idea of being clear. Clear, clear, clear. Yeah, so if you are applying, we just had this last week, if you're applying for a grant or a funding, like an RFP or something, and they use the word objective, and you don't like the word objective, you like the word outcome, it doesn't matter. You follow what the, the grant is doing. It's not the time to, to have a, a, you know, a conversation about whether you use this term or that term. You follow the, whatever their, their, their funding is requesting. Last but not least on grant writing, actually, well, sorry, one more after this, but remember your audience. They, uh, they're not you. Never, I, I, I love acronyms. In fact, I love making up acronyms. But if you use an acronym that's common in your field for something else, you're going to throw off your reviewer. So make sure that you're writing to your audience, not to who you think that your audience should be. And last but not least on grant writing is that they're all about pitches. Marketing people are somebody you want to read, have them re read this. Why? Because they know about pitch. Pitch is about selling something, and that's all grant writing is. When you have 100 grants before you, you have to decide on which is the one or which is a half dozen. And so writing becomes even more critical. And of course, my bias, STLG Teaching Awards. If you're doing really exciting things and you're documenting them and you are doing this in a way, think about applying for different awards, whether they're internally or externally. Because again, there are different ways to go public. 
and thank you.